God continues to lead us from his word. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save you. Well, brothers and sisters, it's to that word that we're going to turn now as, as Greg is going to come and preach. I do have a question for you before he comes, and the question is this from uh, our shorter catechism, question 90. How is the word to be read and heard that it may become effectual to salvation? How is the word to be read and heard that it may become effectual to salvation? It's an important question for us because we're going to hear the word preached. We've, hear, we've heard it read. You read it. Um, so how are, you to, how are you to do that? How are we to come to the scriptures. The catechism says this, that the word may become effectual to salvation, we must attend thereunto with diligence, preparation, and prayer. With diligence, preparation, and prayer. You are being diligent. Why can I say that? You're here, right? And you're here week by week. That's part of of your diligence, part of your participation in worship. So we're going to attend thereunto with diligence, preparation, and prayer. Second, you need to receive it, I need to receive it, with faith and love. Not obstinately, not questioning, not challenging. And it's not that God is not up for your questions. He is. You, you, you have the freedom to do that. But the character of how we are to receive his word is with faith and with love. Thirdly, we're to lay it up in our hearts. Remember it. Talk to each other about it. Talk to yourself about it. Remind yourself of the promises of God. And lastly, and James would have said this if uh, I had read the rest of the passage, fourthly, you're to practice it in our lives. So brothers and sisters, with those ideas in our mind, Let's turn our attention to the Word of God. Turn with me, if you would, to Esther chapter 6. And in your bulletin is the outline. I encourage you to locate that. Use it. Follow along. Take notes. Esther chapter 6, 1 through 3 is the text we're going to be looking at this morning. I'm breaking from my general, or the, what I've been doing, and that is a chapter week. We'll get back to that next week. Um, but this morning, this may, you may not realize, but this is the most important uh, section of, of Esther, these three verses. So let me invite you to stand together with me at the reading of God's Word, and let us fellowship around these God's most holy word. During that night, the king could not sleep, so he gave an order to bring the book of records, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written what Mordecai had reported concerning Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who were doorkeepers, that they had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, what honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai uh, for this? Then the king's servants who attended him said, nothing has been done for him. That's far the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this incredible passage, which, Lord, upon seeing it seems so innocuous, but, Lord, upon studying it, so incredible. Lord, bless our study together. We pray this day, Holy Spirit, give us unction, opening eyes and, and hearts that we might behold and see and enjoy, and be nourished, and built up, and conform to the image of Jesus Christ, to the glory of the praise of your grace. Toward that end, Lord, I pray you give me grace to preach your word with fidelity, and grant his grace, O oh Lord, to receive it. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Except for the very young, I doubt there's, there's anyone in this room have, who have not heard Romans 8.28, which is, and we know, that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, 
to those who are called according to his purpose. We hear a verse like this, and we tend to think of that verse in terms of big things, don't we? God causes all things to work together for good. Hurricane Ian, God's going to use that to work together for good. Cancer, I got cancer. God's going to work together for good. I got in a car wreck. God will use that for good. But we fail to, to think of that verse in light of the insignificant, innocuous, subtle decisions that you and I make on a daily basis. Decisions like missing a stoplight or, or the fact that we missed a stoplight, making the wrong turn on a road, being pestered by an insect. Beautifully illustrated by the story that Corey Ten Boon told in The Hiding Place. If you've read that book, I recommend it, obviously. Corey and her sister Betsy are in a family of uh, Christians, born and raised in a Christian home in the Netherlands. During World War II, they harbored Jews. They protected them from the Germans. Well, in uh, 1944, a neighbor of theirs uh, told on them, and they were arrested February 28th. Um, not all the family was arrested. Most were. Parents were arrested. Dad died in the bit. But Betsy and uh, Corey ended up at the female concentration camp in Ravensbrück, Germany. And that's where they were. 80% of the women in Ravensbrück, Germany were political prisoners. 20% were Jewish. So this is where they threw political prisoners. Well, it was horrible. And Corey really struggled. If you've read the book, you know. She struggled a lot of times. And um, uh, Betsy ended up being her um, Barnabas, encouraging her and lifting her up at those times when she needed it most. And one such time was 30 days when, uh, into their imprisonment. As horrible as it was, they woke up one morning and they were covered with red bumps. And it was flea bites. And Corey was beside herself. She was ready to jump right and she went to Betsy, and she leaned to Betsy, and she grumbled and griped and complained. And Betsy called to mind 1 Thessalonians 5.18, which says, in, um, it says, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And Betsy said, I think, Corey, God would have us to give thanks for these fleas. And Corey, of course, could, said, I, I, I would give thanks for the Bible you smuggled in. I would give thanks for the fact that he enabled us to, to be here. I would, I would not bemoan the fact that we're here, that we're here by God's pro providence. I would give thanks for so many things, even the food that we eat, as bad as it is. But God could not make me give thanks for fleas. A couple months later, Betsy's health was declining She's placed in a knitting group because she couldn't go out and do the hard labor anymore. Her job was knit socks for the guards. So she's in a knitting group, and I'll let Betsy tell the or Corey tell the rest of the story. Speaking of Betsy, this afternoon, Betsy said there'd been a confusion in her knitting group about sock sizes and had asked the supervisor to come and settle it. Betsy speaking, but she wouldn't. She wouldn't step through the door, and neither would the guards. And you know why? Betsy could not keep the triumph from her voice. Because of the fleas. That's what she said. That place is crawling with fleas. And the wise and powerful providence of the Lord God ordained that Corey and Betsy's barrack would be infested with fleas. And it's those fleas that enable them to hold Bible studies without fear of guards to read the scriptures to those dying, to pray openly, to have prayer meetings because of those fleas. Those fleas enable them to minister freely in the name of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, it is not just the big things that work together for good. It's all things. In the passage before us this morning, uh, more than any section of Esther is the poster child, if you will, of Romans 8.28. It is, I titled it, The Subtlety of God's Providence because it describes the victory of God's people in, 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 in a way that we would have never guessed um, ever that God would deliver his people the way that he does. So let's dive into this. 
To do that, though, I want to begin by giving you the providential background. I want you to look back a little, a little bit with me, do a little bit of review, a little bit, and then we'll dive into our text. Providential background. For that, we go back to chapter 2. And you're not going to hear that if you're using the phone. Okay, go back in your phone to, Providence, or to uh, Esther chapter 2. You recall this chapter. I labeled it the mystery of God's providence because in it, it has basically showcases five different avenues by which God could deliver his people. Again, we know that we're supposed to read chapter 2 in light of chapter 6 and the deliverance. So when we look at this chapter, we are, le- we are left faced with the question, uh, if you will, watching the drama unfold before our eyes Is this the vehicle by which God will deliver his people? And each one are unsavory. We've got the deposition of Ashti, the queen of Persia, to begin with. Uh, Okay, that's not very good. Then we've got Mordecai, the introduction of Mordecai and and Esther. And we've seen chapter 2, 3, and 4. They don't speak highly of them. Now, brothers and sisters, I say this, and some of you here, they were horrible sinners who who needed church discipline. I'm not saying that. They were worldly people. Just like me, just like you, okay? They, they struggled with, with very uh, uh, typical struggles and typical sins that we have as God's people. And uh, for them, um, for Mordecai and, and, and for Esther, it was uh, pronounced in that they, they hid their lamp under a bushel. They didn't let people know who they were. Um, and so we see them and we see this process, this gross process by which God would, would, uh, by, by which, um, Ahasuerus and by God's, uh, providence, um, they would bring in the next queen. Then we read of, of Esther's success and how she becomes the next queen and there's compromise there, guys. She's, she's marrying a pagan. At this time, what's going on in Palestine? God's people are marrying non-believers. And what did God do there? He said, get rid of them. But not so with Esther. Esther is, is willingly trying to be the married, the, the spouse of this man. So a lot of compromise. If you're reading this as a Jew, um, first time you're going, whoa, those would be compromised, compromised Jews. Wow, amazing. And then we read the very end part, Mordecai is a judge, a Persian judge, and he uncovers this, this, this very, uh, um, disjointed story, because it doesn't fit here. This innocuous story where, um, he's sitting there in the court, um, hearing, overhearing two of the court members talk about killing Ahasuerus. So he tells Esther, and Esther tells the king, and, you know the rest of the story. The two are in- investigated and found to be guilty, and they're they're executed. and And we read sort of a very a very key verse in chapter two, verse twenty three, when we read now when the plot was investigated and found to be so, they were both hanged on gallows, and it was written in the book of the chronicles in the king's presence. And when we looked at this passage, I suggested to you that if you had to choose what would be the vehicle through which God would deliver His people, that would be the last one you'd probably guess. You'd say probably Mordecai, maybe Esther. Now, don't misunderstand using Aristotle, okay? Don't uh, misunderstand. All of what we just read or saw that I just described are material causes. They're part of the solution. It's not that they don't have any part of God's delivering his people. Of course they did. But the efficient cause we get directed to, we get pointed at in chapter 2, verse 23 and following. And we know this, we know this very strongly because the book of Esther is a chiasm. Now, what is that? This is review. Well, Hebrew and Greek did not have the ability. They didn't have punctuation marks. Modern Bibles do, but they didn't back then. No punctuation marks. They couldn't underline. They didn't underline. They couldn't bold. And so the way that they emphasized, the way we would, we, we do it, the way they did it was, was they would, um, through word placement in a sentence, repetition, sentence structure. So for example, Paul, you'll hear perhaps in a Bible study or a, a commentary or a sermon, Paul placed this word in the emphatic position. What does that mean? He put it at the beginning of the sentence. Okay, so for example, Ephesians 2, 4, but God. Greek typically begins a sentence not with a noun, but God. Okay, it's huge. Okay, it's a massive statement in the emphatic opposition. Secondly, you'll think of, of repetition. Christ frequently said, truly, truly, I say to, uh, to you, or holy, holy, holy. Emphasis, brothers and sisters. God is a holy God. 
if you were writing this in, if we were writing it, we might have bolded, underlined it, double underlined it, highlighted it, right? Um, there's all kinds of things that we might do to, to say God's holy. But the way they did it was through repetition. Well, a third way was through structure, sentence structure or book structure. And that was known as a chiasm. Now, what's a chiasm? In your notes, I got a little X there, which is the Greek chi. It's the capital chi, okay? And you'll notice a little of the little yellow, Okay, if you look at the, at the Greek chai sideways, you see there's this little um, arrow, if you will, right? A line going down, a line going back. Well, a chiasm, Bible scholars years, you know, centuries ago, saw this pattern at, at times in Scripture, where you'd have a, a, a statement repeated, or a statement, another statement, and then another statement, and then they're repeated. So, for example, you got it in your notes. God is great, that's A, A prime, alpha prime, awesome is his name. Those say the same thing. They, they're repetitious. God takes care of the earth. B, B prime. God upholds his people. And then C, let all the nations praise him. And what they discovered was, if you align it like that, it's the center statement, which is the focus, the emphasis, what they're trying to say. Guys, the, if, if we were writing it regularly in our language, we would have bolded it, underlined it, height, you know, done what we could to say, this is the point. This is who God is. And you know what he does? Or what, what should happen? All the world should praise him. Now, I wrote that. That's not from a psalm. I could have gotten a psalm, but I wrote that. Um, Esther is a chiasm. Notice, you got there in your notes. Chapter 1, the opening. Chapter 10, the epilogue. So the opening and the close. Chapter 2 and 3, the king's first decree. Chapter 8 and 9, the king's second decree. Chapter 4 and 5, the clash between Haman and Mordecai. Chapter 6, 4 through 7, 10, Mordecai's triumph over Haman. And in the middle is Esther 6, 1 through 3, our passage, which tells us that this is the highlight. This is the point of this book. Now you're going, well, we just read. You're saying that's the point of the book? I mean, look at it, brothers and sisters. You know, during the night, the king couldn't sleep, and so he called his advisors. They read. They read about a Mordecai. And has anyone been, has he been rewarded? No, he hasn't. That's the point of this book? You gotta be kidding me. How can that be the point of this book? Yet, brothers and sisters, it is by virtue of the chiasm. And ironically, back chapter 2, 21 and tw through 23, about him finding out the, the, the you know, revealing the, uh, um, assassination plot, that points us to the efficient cause of God's deliverance for his people. Okay, that being said, by design, you have to see it. The focus of this book points and flows from chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, which makes these verses the pivotal message in this book. And so with this section, we have the subtlety of God's providence. I call it subtle because you and I are reading this going, what? How can how can God deliver through, through that? Um, because, brothers and sisters, this is the focus and the key. This is how God began the deliverance of his people. With that, let me give you one more running start. The immediate context. Say, oh, okay, so let me, let, let me brief you on what we just read. For that, we begin in chapter 4. So Esther and Mordecai, they're, they are compromised Jews. They've struggled the whole bit. Um, typical Jews of their day, but maybe a little bit more worldly. By the time we get to chapter 4, as we saw two weeks ago, God, nevertheless by his Spirit, opened their eyes and they beheld the glory of God's character and the glory of his promise. They saw his person. The Spirit of God used the Word of God, Genesis 12, 15, and 17, opening Mordecai's eyes to something that perhaps he knew in his heart, just like we know, but never struck him. Didn't have any kind of feasting upon those words. But at this moment in his life, all of a sudden those promises became dear to him. Who God is, who our God is, and what he's promised us. From this, brothers and sisters, we talked then and will continue to talk that this emphasized the inglorious grace of God by which he cares for his people, even in their compromise. We have a performance-based um, uh, uh, um, desire in every one of us who wants to relate to God on the basis of our conduct. Well, God's people were doing that here. 
And because of their because they were compromised, we know that during this era, redemptive history, this was a horrible time of God's people compromising against God. Oh, there were the high points when they rebuilt the, the temple by faith. But this is way after that. It was 516. We're now at 480, and this is written around 420. So brothers and sisters, this is that era where God's people are compromised. Horribly so. And yet, in the midst of this compromise and in the midst of this trial and this difficulty, God took Mordecai as sort of the prototype of his people. He is the type. He represents the people of God, Mordecai and Esther, but specifically Mordecai. This compromised Jew, could God care for him? That's why the book of Esther doesn't have God's name in it. It wasn't not because God wasn't part of their lives, but because they thought he wasn't. How could God care about us? We're compromised. So we'll do our thing. We go to church. We read the Bible. We pray. We do all that stuff. But we don't expect a whole lot from God. Why? Because we feel guilty. There's this, there's this corporate, individual and corporate guilt that we can never measure up. And that is why the famine. And that is why the disease. And that is why things are going hard for us. They were misunderstanding God's character. So God comes and shows Mordecai, Mordecai, God's grace is huge. If he's claimed you as his own, he'll never let you go. Nothing you could do could ever have you let go. Well, then why the difficulty last week? Why? Because, brothers and sisters, it's not there because you've done bad things. It's there to temper us and wean us from the world. You could be the most devout, the, 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 uh, the doing everything right, and you're still going to have trial. You're still going to have difficulty. Why? Not because God doesn't love you, but because he loves you. What parent did there that doesn't discipline their children? God disciplines those he loves. So Mordecai comes in chapter 4 to this glorious revelation. He shares with Esther, which likewise changes her. They go to a three-day fast, day and night where they're not eating, uh, where they're basically, when you fast in Scripture, you're pouring your heart out into the Lord, depending. Wow, what an incredible change. They, and what, and how did God use them? Many Jews were following their example. Wow, this revival's going on. And then we read last week, on the third day of the fast, not after the fast, not the fourth day, but on the third day, Esther approaches Ahasuerus, risking her life, right? If you approach the king on the throne and he didn't call you, he could kill you unless he uh, says you can come. So she approaches him on the third day. Now, brothers and sisters, what we know about Ahasuerus makes us think, what is she thinking? Let me read to you a passage, Esther 2, 2. Then the king's attendants who served him said, this is Let's Vashti's deposed. Let's get a new person. Then the king's attendants who served him said, this is the qualification for the next queen. Now, why was Vashti deposed? Because of character. Guess what the quality, that was the only qualification necessary for the next queen you think would be character, right? Oh no, it tells you how shallow Ahasuerus is. The only quality was she had to be pretty. Notice. Then the king's attendants who served him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king and let the king appoint overseers in all the provinces of the kingdom so that they may gather every beautiful young virgin to Seuss the, the capital, to the harem, and to the custody of Haggai and the king's eunuch who was in charge of the women and let their, uh, their cosmetics be given them. Then the young lady, young, beautiful virgins who please the king the most will replace Vashti. If you knew you were married to a man like that, if you knew your spouse was that superficial, that worldly, that um, shallow, do you think you'd go to him if you need, you need him and you don't want to die? Do you think you'd go to him looking your worst? I mean, think of the difference between Esther in chapter 2 and Esther chapter 6. Esther chapter 2, she embraced getting ready to meet this guy. She was all about the cosmetics. She was all about bedalling herself up for a whole year. And this one... That's gone. Why? Because, brothers and sisters, she has come to the realization of who her God is. And her God holds the king's heart in his hand. And wherever he turns the king's heart, that's where the king goes. Esther doesn't need all that stuff. She just needs God to enable her. So she approaches the king, trusting him. And chapter 5, you, what do you want? And he brings her in. And she, he says, what do you want? Anything up to half the kingdom. What does she, she say? I want you and Haman to come to a banquet. All right, great. Then in chapter six, uh, five, uh, five and six, uh, five through nine, at the banquet, what do you want? I want another banquet. 
Now, she's being masterful here, brothers and sisters, as you know. She is um, seeking to enable her husband, Ahasuerus, to come willingly and give her what she wanted without argument or lengthy explanation or defense. So she's, she's being really wise here, trusting God to do it. And with that, the, 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 the um, banquet's over, the first banquet, the end of chapter 5. Haman leaves, feeling really big about himself because his Achilles heel is public recognition. He leaves, can't wait to tell everybody he knows, I was invited to a special meeting with the king and the queen. That's how incredible I am. And as he leaves, Mordecai, he passes Mordecai who refuses to stand. Refuses to receive. So, brothers and sisters, he had a wonderful revival, but pride's hard to give up. And Mordecai's not giving that one up. He still does not, you know, you can just see him. You know, and Haman goes by, and Haman, that just instills anger in this man. He goes to his family. He invites his uh, uh, great friends, counselors, and there he just pours his heart out. Man, this is all the things that I, man, look how great I am. Look at all these wonderful things. But I can't live in a world where that stupid idiot Mordecai exists. So what did his wife say? Well, kill him. Build a gallows, 75 feet tall. Put him on, impale him on a pole, 75 feet tall. And he's thinking, man, that's the answer. So brothers and sisters, as we enter into our chapter, We have more at peril than just the Jews. Because you think about it. This is the night. So this is the next day. This is the evening into the next day. So we've had a three-day fast. This is day four. The end of the night, Haman goes. Now we're going into day five. And if Esther has the banquet and it's successful as she's hoping, the Jews will be spared. But Mordecai will be dead. Mordecai is a hypo, uh, what do you call it? He's a a type of the people of God. So chapter 6 is not the deliverance of the Jews yet. It's the deliverance of Mordecai, who is the Jews, who represents the people of God, the prototype. This is the people of God. And the irony is this. Ahasuerus, as we'll see, is burdened. Actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll just say this, that if it keeps on going the way that it looks like, Mordecai, yeah, the Jews will be saved, but Mordecai will, will have lost, will have perished. And that brings us now to the beginning of the deliverance of God's people. Notice with me verse 1. During that night, the king could not sleep. Literally, the, um, the sleep of the king fled. So he wants to sleep, but it ran away. It fled. So he gave an order to bring the book of the records, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. Now, as this is the focus, based on the the chiasm, this is the focus. This verse is packed. Let's unpack it. First and foremost, I want you to notice that as another literary tool, the descriptions have slowed down. Okay? Understand this. Lift your head. If you're wandering, come back to me here, okay? So the beauty of Hebrew prose, the, the rapidity, okay? If you go to Esther chapter 1, we have the fourth year of his reign, I think it was. I forgot what the year of the reign was. But then there's a four-year gap between chapter 1 and chapter 2. So we're flying. By the time we get to chapter 3, verse 7, it's been seven years. So we're flying through the history. Four years, seven years, wham! And then we get to chapter 3, verse 8, and everything slows down to the course of five days. And then it picks back up in chapter 9. If you read chapter 9, we're, we're, we're much further in the future. We're 11 months later. But this little inside, and that's a literary tool you'll see in the, in the uh, prophet or the uh, Psalter. A lot. You'll see sentences that might be three syllables long in the Hebrew, right? God is just. God is great. It'll do that for three or four verses. And then you'll get three or four sentences which have 20 syllables in it. And then it goes back to being fast. And you see this. We want you to slow down and meditate. Contemplate what you just read. That's what the text is telling us to do. And if you were to, to, to if think of slowing things down, we're in slow motion at this point. We are getting a detail 
of a king. If you were watching this as a stage play, you'd seen the, the king. We probably spend five or ten minutes with him tossing and turning and buffing his pillow and, you know, uh, moaning, uh, tossing and turning. So we read it. During the night, the king could not sleep. So first, it's very late, probably three to four o'clock in the morning. We know that because Haman, in just a bit, is going to be heard in the outer court. And he, Haman would have come the next morning. So it's probably four o'clock in the morning now. And this king has been sleep fled. It's been gone all night. And he's been tossing and turning and struggling. Now, brothers and sisters, unlike Nebuchadnezzar, who we can read in Scripture, couldn't sleep, but that was because of his dreams. And unlike Darius, who couldn't sleep because of the fate of Daniel, this text gives us no reason for why Ahasuerus couldn't sleep. And the implication boldly in the Hebrew is he couldn't sleep because God took it from him. God and his providence did something so insignificant, you'd never even think about it. He stopped this man from sleeping. He chased his sleep away. And then we, we read, um, so he gave an order to bring the book of the records, the chronicles, and they read and they were read before the king. What do you do if you can't sleep? What do you do in our day? Well, you typically, you get out of bed. Oh, this is so dumb. I've been here for three hours. I'm just going to get up. And now notice he doesn't read. So you can't read. This is not one of the options. He turns on what back then would have been the entertainment. He turns on the TV. It's what many people do. I can't sleep. I'll just go down and watch C-SPAN or something, right? And that'll put me to bed, right? Other than the blue, what is it, blue light, right? But that'll put me to bed. That's what he does, right? He brings the chronicles of the king, and they were read. Uh, Brian Gregory wrote of this. This would have been about as thrilling as reading a phone book. And having them read in the middle of the night would have been a good way to try to fall back asleep. So he's, he's doing what we would do. I am tired. Just give me something that I can doze off to, right? Play some, some waves in the background or something. Let me sleep. And at this point, brothers and sisters, it's important to, to, uh, to note what therefore this text does not say. When Herod couldn't sleep, guess what, Jer guess what Matthew says? All of Jerusalem was shaking. All of Ju Jerusalem was disturbed. What do we read in chapter 1 or 6-1? What do we read there? We just read the king couldn't sleep. Which means, guess what? The rest of the kingdom could. It's quiet. No one's awake. Everyone's sleeping. Except the king and now these unfortunate servants who have to get up and read to him. They're all asleep. Where's Mordecai? Sleeping. What's Esther doing? Sleeping. What are all the Jews doing after the three-day fast? They ate a really big meal, fourth day, and they are dreaming like they haven't dreamt before because they finally at eight after three days. Everyone is fast asleep. And that brings us then to the efficient cause of God's deliverance, verse 2. And it was found written that Mordecai had reported concerning Big Thana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who were doorkeepers, that they had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. Brothers and sisters, this is a fact uh, that woke up, didn't make him fall asleep. It woke up the king because culturally speaking, this was a massive, a massive faux pas. That, that, that um, well, actually, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. At this point, this king's not uh, sleeping. He reads this. It starts to, to wake him up. It shines light on the um, past, what God did with Big Thana and with Mordecai and how it was recorded in the book. And this verse begs us to ask the question, the multiple questions. I've got them in your outline to think. It begs us, yes, to ask these very important questions. One, how is it that the king could not sleep? Answer, by the, providential, by the providential will of God. How is it that the king did not turn to entertainment or pleasure to, to, to bide his time? It was on account of the providence of the Lord. How is it that the king uh, really wanted to sleep, rather, and so commanded a servant to read from the scroll? The providence of the Lord. 
How is it that, that Ahasuerus' servants turned to the section in the King's Chronicles which contained the story? The providential will of the Lord. How is it that the king was not nodding off at that point, but awake enough to understand what was read? The providential will of the Lord. And how is it that years before when Mordecai saved the life of the king, no honor was given to him? Now I want you to pause the, the, the movie a second. Hear that again. Read that sentence again. How is it that years before when Mordecai saved the life of the king, no honor was given to him? How would you like to be Mordecai? You do a good deed, and it's completely missed. Can you imagine how this man felt? God, typical. Obviously, you're against me. I saved the king's life. I, we've, you've heard, it's, it's renowned what happens when people save the king's life. They get property, power, possessions, wealth, all kinds of honors. How is it that I'm missed, Lord? Something as insignificant as that. And yet, brothers and sisters, that was at the hand of God. At the time, misunderstood, no doubt, by Mordecai, perhaps even made him a little angry or alienated. Who knows? But that was at the hand of God. Why? Why? Ian DeGuid wrote, God's sovereignty didn't end with keeping the king awake. He also directed his choice of alternate activities in the night and the absence of late night television and insomnia like Ahasuerus had no lack of potential entertainments, food, drink, dancing, girls, not to mention an enormous harem, all kinds of pleasures waiting at his disposal. Yet he chose instead to listen to a reading from the governmental records, the chronicles of his reign. That's the emphasis here, guys. As you read this, it's slowed down and, you're, and you're, you're, you're called, you and I are called to read this pensively, meditatively. Wait a second here. Why isn't he sleeping? Because his sleep fled. Well, who, who made it run away? God. I mean, God's the unnamed name of hero here, right? Who made it run away? God. Why did they choose that scroll? And why did they open up to that place? And why did the king, why wasn't the king asleep at that point? Instead, he woke up. Why, why, why? And why wasn't Mordecai awarded, rewarded? All these questions come as we contemplate this beautiful passage. And that brings us to verse 3. And the king said, What honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for, uh, for this? Uh, this is where I jumped to earlier when I messed up. Okay. Thus, uh, then the king's servants who attended him said, nothing has been done uh, for him. Brothers and sisters, it was a massive faux pas. Because in that day, if you saved the king's life and you weren't award, rewarded, the king would be viewed as unjust. Secondly, that certainly doesn't encourage other people who hear threats on the king to stand up and say, by the way, I heard a threat on the king. That's why they rewarded people so well if they, if they uncovered a threat. Because it encouraged every, everybody, wait a second, you mean to tell me, I overhear my estranged dad planning to kill the king? I get land, property, money, wealth, and all my worries are, are gone? Pretty good deal, okay? Brothers and sisters, this king gets said, he's like, this is bad. This is really bad. So at this moment, he realizes a justice of massive proportions has been neglected. We have got to honor this justice. Now, the irony is, at that very moment, Haman, who himself feels like we have to address an injustice, a man has to honor me. So the whole thing begins revolving around honor. And the irony is, watching this, it begs a massive question. What's the, the question? Ahasuerus wants to honor Mordecai. Haman wants himself to be honored, so he wants to kill Mordecai. And we're wondering, why aren't these people honoring God and his people? The whole thing is revolving around showcasing. Do you see the problem here? They're not honoring God. They're so worried about um, horizontal honor, they've missed the bigger picture. And so the king gets up and says, man, and so next week we'll pick up at verse 4 where Haman's in the court. For now, brothers and sisters, I want to spend time just wrapping this up by application. What difference does this make? How do we apply this? Well, brothers and sisters, per the chiasm, the rest of this chapter flows from it. So don't misunderstand. Everything we read are material causes. 
So they're important. So don't say, oh, so it's not important what happens next. No, no, it's very important. But this is the center of this book, and this is the emphasis of this book. And the emphasis is what? The subtlety of God's providence. And this is it in a nutshell. What were Esther, Mordecai, and the rest of the Jews doing at this moment? That the deliverance for Mordecai and God's people commenced. What were they doing? Say it. What were they doing? Sleeping. Wait, if, if they're living according to performance, the things they do can compromise or forfeit God's blessing, then we would have to say God's blessing of deliverance could only come if the Jews did something. What were they doing? Nothing. Do you see the subtlety of God's providence? Psalm 127, God gives to his beloved even in their sleep. Our God doesn't slumber. Psalm 121, behold, he who keeps Israel neither slumber nor, nor sleep. While you and I sleep, when you and I are checked out of the world, when you and I choose this apple over that, when you and I are pestered by a small little fly and we think nothing about it, you have to understand that God means what he says when he says, all things work together for good to those who love God. Every providence that, oh, that, that occurs in your life works together for good. Fleas included. Sleep included. Is that incredible? Psalm 121, or is 127, the full text is, unless the Lord builds the house, the labor in vain who, who build it. Here, here you go, guys. God is crossing out a performance. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labor. Does that mean we shouldn't rise up early and retire late, right? No. What he's saying is you don't bank on those as somehow earning God's favor. Why? Because God blesses you. Me? You mean sinner Greg? Yeah. Worldly Greg? Yeah. Compromise Greg? Yeah. He blesses us in his sleep. In our sleep. That's the subtlety of God's providence. It's always, God, brothers and sisters, this world is advancing. It's always advancing unto God's glory, the praise and the glory of his grace, and the benefit of God's people. All of it is. Do you see it? That's what chapter 6, 1 through 3 is so beautiful. Where's Mordecai? Where's Esther? Where's the fasting? Where's all the, where's all the things that they've done and going to do? Hey, those are material causes. They're important. We're not going to say they're not important. But what is it that made the difference? It was God, just like in Nebuchadnezzar's day, just like in Darius. It was God vanquishing another empire without the help of God's people. Isn't that incredible? That's your God. That is our God. And the same promises that, that bless Mordecai and Esther are, your, are promises given to you as well. Incredible. How do you apply this? Brothers and sisters, let me ask you something before I ask the last questions on, the, on your sheet. What are the fleas in your life? What are they? Well, you know what we're talking about now because of Corey. You know, those things that you can't stand. Those things you could never thank God for. I, that bad past of mine, I would never thank God for that. I would never thank God for, name all the different things. What are the fleas of your life? Do you understand that the world you may have meant it for ill, but God always is going to work for you. God's people, his children, his covenant bride, it will always be for good. So as we look at this passage and we seek to apply it, we have to look at, it's a chiasm. Everything beforehand leads to chapter six. Everything after six leads away. And all of it together is pointing at this. So we have to take the whole book as a whole to apply this. What's the application? Brothers and sisters, first and foremost, what is God's disposition towards his people? It's always 
always one of, of love, of cherishing. It's always one of commitment because of his covenant promises. So when we come to this chapter, unlike the Jews who were thinking my performance has compromised God's love for me, which is why we're struggling. No, you know what? Brothers and sisters, why were they struggling? Two reasons. One, because they weren't living in the age of miracles anymore. They were done with that, just like us. The canon's not being written. Okay, this is the tail end. No more prophets, right? Malachi be the last prophet. This is the end. They're living in the, in the valley between massive redemptive eschatological movements of God. They're living in the valley. Just nothing there, brothers and sisters. Secondly, why were they struggling? Because that's how God tempers faith. They, because of the performance, concluded God must hate me, as I said. Brothers and sisters, one, God doesn't hate you. He loves you in Christ. Yeah, but how much of my sin? What about my sin? What about my failure? What about how I've let him down? Brothers and sisters, in Christ, you haven't let him down. 2 Corinthians 5.20, hear the words carefully. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of Christ. If you owed a million dollars and Christ came or our person came and wiped out that debt, you'd be grateful, wouldn't you? But you wouldn't be out of the woods. Why? Because what got you a million dollars in debt? Because you're going to get in debt again. So even though all your million dollars canceled, that, that's not what you need that, but you need more. What you need is someone paying for your future. That's what it means that you have become the righteousness of God. Christ not only paid your debt, but he gives you the right standing of Christ forevermore. So stop relating to God on your performance. Look at the providences of the Lord as all of it is done by a God who has your best interest in mind. That's Mordecai. That's Esther. So God is the sovereign over all things such that his providential will determines not only the big things of life, but all things. Secondly, because of our relationship with Christ, God is committed to us and our best no matter what. Now, does God, God discipline us? Yes, <laughs> but that's good. Bitter providence occur in our lives not because God is punishing us for sin, but weaning us from the, our love affair with this world. And as God neither slumbers nor sleeps, we must therefore live with the conviction that all things, from the most insignificant to the large, but for us the most insignificant, work together for good to those who love God according to his purposes. Now, if you doubt that, if you leave here going, I'm struggling, Greg, or this week find yourself going, I heard the sermon, but this isn't fair. I don't like what I'm seeing. Octavius Winslow would tell you this, and I close with this quote. It is because we have such shallow views of God's love that we have such defective views of God's dealings. We blindly interpret the symbols of his providence because we so imperfectly read the engravings of his heart. Brothers and sisters, all things work together for your good according to the providence of the Lord because of Jesus Christ in you. What a fantastic center of this book. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful that you slow us down in this book to chapter six. We're so grateful that this book points, you, you have demonstrated that this book points to this section for us to sit down and contemplate and meditate upon and see ourselves in Mordecai's shoes. And, and Lord, behold, you delivered him even while he slept. That indeed, even these things were going to work together for good. For we know the rest of the story. If I pray that you would strengthen us in the inner man or woman. Enabling us, O oh God, to have a faith that is, be, beguiles the rational, beguiles the non-believer. That we would have a faith so set in you and your character and your promises that we are immovable steadfast, and thus always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our work is never in vain. God, I pray you'd, you'd engender faith. And those who hearing this may not know you, but then, Lord, you would strengthen faith in everyone else hearing this. Lord, bless us as we look at this passage that we might believe 
And in believing, we might enjoy the life that you've given us in Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.